Week one of spring football is in the books, folks, and we learned quite a bit about this new look Alabama football program. Hey, what's up? Hello, everybody. Welcome to Roll Pod, an Alabama sports podcast from Bama 247. I am staff writer Cody Goodwin, along with my teammates, Mike Rodak and Alex Scarborough, and we're here to discuss spring football. Um, like I mentioned, three practices in Alabama now with its spring football schedule, 12 more to go. They're off this week. For spring break. So I figured now would probably be a good time to kind of look back at the first week of spring football and kind of discuss some of the more interesting things that we learned and we saw. Obviously, we had blanket coverage at Bama247.com, but we're going to kind of touch on the more interesting things, um, you know, and maybe why they were the more interesting things to us for both the offense and the defense. Before we jump into that, um, guys, how are we doing? Have we adjusted to the time change yet? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> We talked about before we started recording, having kids and, and Cody one day, he'll figure this. It just throws everything's up for a loop. Today's ruined, but we can do the pod and we'll get on with it. I would think that they're like young enough still that they just like don't know what's going on, but may, I, maybe they do. I don't know. Maybe no. that's part of the problem is they don't. <laughs> they wake up at the same time as they did previously and we wake up later. It just doesn't, it doesn't work for a couple of days, but I, I think statistically they say like people adjust by Wednesday. So I feel like Wednesday is the hump day, literally and figuratively as far as uh, the time change goes. That's good. That's good. So Wednesday will have marked one week since we talked to Alabama's defense. I think I know we talked pre recording that we were going to start with the offense, but I figured we could start with the defense there. That seems like an easy segue. Um, we got to meet the defensive staff. We got to talk to Alabama defensive coordinator Kane Womack. We got to talk to a handful of returning players. We got to talk to the assistant coaches. A lot of new things going on with Alabama spring ball. Um, before we jump into maybe some of the things that we learned, what were your guys' maybe initial impressions of talking to more than just the head coach when it comes to Alabama availability? We got to talk to the DC. We got to talk to the assistants. What did you guys think? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it wasn't anything – explosive um which is you know I, I don't know exactly all the reasoning behind you know why Nick Saban did things the way that he did but I think part of it is like you want one message you want one person talking you're kind of speaking for the group obviously implied within that is that sometimes you don't trust what other people are saying on your staff and I think that's probably part of Nick Saban's reasoning but after listening to Kane Womack and Freddie Roach and uh, I wasn't over for Colin Hitchler or Maurice Linguist, but it's not as if they're out there like disrespecting the head coach or, or contradicting the head coach or it's, it's, it's all the same message and it's all um, very within bound. So, um, you know, I'm sure Tommy Reese and Kevin Steele could have been the same way. Like it, it's just, this is probably the way things should be. And I, I, again, I don't think there's any downside. I think it was pretty painless as far as Alabama and, and Kalen DeBoer we're concerned just kind of listening to these guys. And, you know, the, the upside is that we get to learn more about specific positions, specific players, um, you know, especially when let's say this was still a Nick Saban regime, we probably would have had maybe one press conference with him last week and eight questions maybe. And you're not asking about all these different guys when you get eight, eight questions. So, you know, we're able to get in more in depth about, Keon Keeley and James Brockemeyer and, and certain guys on, on either side of the ball that we maybe would have gotten a kind of surface level um, answer about previously. Now we're able to go more in depth. So it's uh, again, I don't think there is any obvious downside. There's no problems with them talking. It's just, you know, Nick Saban did things the way that he wanted to do them. And, and Kalen DeBoer is very open to doing things the way that, that he's done them here so far. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's no schematic uh, uh, disadvantage at this point in the season. You're not talking about the upcoming opponent. You don't have uh, Maurice Linguist saying we're running zone and Kane Womack saying, no, we're running man. Like That's not <laughs> happening. And but, but I think the thing that I kind of walked away from is that um, is, is just big picture. The, the overall energy of this unit is different. Um, not to say it'll be more successful or less successful, but Nick Saban was about his business and that was it. And he, he knew one way of doing it. And this is a little bit of a different way where it's more energy, more enthusiasm, maybe a little bit more positive reinforcement. We saw that from Kane Womack during the, the practice period where we were out there. A lot of got, getting guys' ears and trying to coach them through things, patting them on the butt, sending them on his way. And then just, just the energy you go over and talk. I, I dare you to talk to Maurice Linguist about football and this program individually and not come away energized about it. 
So I think they're all bringing something to it. And when we talk about big picture, why it might be important to have them out there, it's us relaying that information, right? And and them being on video, being like, hey, this is what we're doing. And if you think that's not reaching recruits, it definitely is. So uh, getting, a, getting a feel for their personalities, what they're going to bring out to practice, and then kind of how they see things working big picture. Again, it's super early, but talking through things like the secondary where there's a lot of uh, pieces that are going to need to be kind of figured out there, how they see that. And uh, I think one early impression from linguists is, and the whole staff is they really like Malachi Moore. So if they can start there, we'll figure out the rest. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I think the the thing with Saban was the whole, you know, one program, one voice thing. And, um, you know, I think he was just kind of doing his best to maybe, you know, for lack of a better phrase, shut everybody up so that it was kind of, you know, Hey, this is how we're doing things. He's going to keep the train on the tracks when it comes to just the outward public message. Um, but I, one thing that really kind of came to mind to me was I remember DeBoer, it was probably during either his introductory press conference, or maybe when we first got to talk to him, um, shortly after that press conference, he is in this for coaching development as much as player development. And, you know, you look at the guys that he's got on his staff, specifically the defensive staff, there's two former sitting head coaches on this staff, right? Kane Womack, Mo Linguist, everybody else um, is, you know, wants to be a head coach at some point, um, you know, or go from assistant to coordinator or coordinator to head coach. Um, this allows them to get practice, right? Like they're going to get practice reps with us. They're going to get practice reps just talking in front of the media. Um, that's kind of part of that whole coaching development thing. I think the other thing too, is like, to your point, Alex, on just the, the good energy and the good vibes, um, there is a lot of excitement because nothing bad has happened yet. Right. Knock on wood. Um, and then, you know, I, I guess on, when it comes to the idea of like one, one program, one voice, there's really like, they, they're still learning, right? Like there's still a lot that they're trying to, you know, figure out in terms of, you know, personnel in terms of what works and what doesn't like they, I don't know that there are even any secrets to hide, so to speak. Right. So that's, you know, maybe that's the other thing that's kind of fun. Maybe from our end, we get to talk to all these guys and they're a lot more open with us. Um, at least, you know, when we first got to talk to them last week, you know, it was, it was really fun to just kind of, you know, listen to all their personalities and their stories and, I'm pretty sure each of them at some point was asked like, Hey, like, why did you, you know, follow DeBoer from Washington or why did you decide to join his defensive staff? Or, you know, it was kind of fun to hear some of those stories. So um, yeah, a lot of good vibes. Um, also music playing at practice and I'm not sure who the DJ is, but kudos to those guys. So that was kind of cool to hear too. It's uh, Robbie Proano, who's the new uh, recruiting assistant. He came from Washington. He was sitting there with the iPad and um, I guess being the DJ running the tunes, whatever you want to call it. Um, so yeah, it's, it was different, you know, practice felt a little bit different. Um, you know, the energy thing is something you hear a lot of players bring up and I think they're careful, especially the ones who've been here before to like make it seem like they're disparaging Nick Saban. Cause obviously they don't, they don't want to do that, but you know, players, I think are certainly talking about a different energy and different vibe. Um, and I, I think it's in a very positive way. It's in a good way that they're describing that. So, um, you know, that's. Again, we've only been out there for 20 minutes and they've only had three practices. We've only been a had access to one of them. So it's not like we have this huge sample size to judge everything off of. And like you said, nothing really bad has happened. We're not watching a practice after that has lost the game. We're watching a practice in March. But, um, you know, it does seem like it's it's a more positive vibe. You know, Kalen DeBoer, I think, is going to be talking in much more positive terms. Um and Nick Saban, I think, certainly did too. But we all know, like Nick Saban can, if he's not happy with something, is is going to let people know about it. So, you know, I think the board is going to be a little bit more muted. Um, you know, a little bit more. You know, everything's going well. Everything's fine. Like, I, I don't think we're going to hear a ton of like ripping into the team and having these explosive press conference moments that. Um, classically Nick Saban did. Obviously that a lot of that kind of dwindled, I'd say the last couple of years. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if we'll miss them uh, having to uh, deal with that environment, but I think fans will miss those a little bit. And one last thing on the music, I did ask Robert Gillespie, <laughs> like, at what point do you get to take a turn on the playlist? It said, man, I'm just trying to get these guys lined up in the right spot right now. I'm not worried <laughs> about all that. I think, I think it's fun for us to talk about, but he said, look, I just tune it out at a certain point. Now, if you're, third on the depth chart and you're just kind of hanging out, maybe it keeps your energy up a little bit. I don't know, but uh, it, it's a different, a different kind of uh, look and sound. 
and it's worth noting too, like it wasn't as if the practices were silent under Nick Saban when they were practicing for road games, like there was fake crowd noise that was in there. So um, ultimately that's, I think the biggest benefit that you can get from having music or noise, whether it's again, actual lyrics or just noise um, because you need players to, to be able to operate in that environment, be able to communicate. Um, now it's also going to be different this year because of the headsets. And so, if you have really loud music, a really loud crowd, can players hear through the helmet, offensive or defensively? That's something they're going to have to figure out. So, I, I, you know, I think there's a practical benefit to doing it rather really on top of just, you know, guys kind of jamming out and grooving out during practice. Hopefully there's a Spotify playlist somewhere because that would be kind of fun. You really want to tap into like the youth market and a different type of the fandom like here's what Alabama players listen to while they're at practice, right? Like and you can, NIL opportunity. You can yeah. have fans. <laughs> What's up Spotify? Rights, yeah, to the playlist every day. That'd be kind of fun. That'd be kind of fun. Okay, regarding the defense, what I wanted to do today um, was kind of another round table, kind of like what we did last week, except instead of what we're looking forward to or a question we want answered, what did we learn? What was something that we found interesting? Um, Alex, start with you. When it comes to Alabama's defense, when we talked to them last Wednesday, got to watch practice for a little bit, what kind of stood out to you? What did you find interesting about that availability? Yeah, I think I'd go back to what I, what I mentioned kind of off the top is that it's it's Malachi Moore and then it's fill in the blank. Uh, I think there's uh, – and I think what's interesting is how they're approaching it. You know, we, we've made a lot of uh, a lot of hay about talking about, you know, the four two five versus Nick Saban's base defense and what are the responsibilities of the cornerback, uh, you know, boundary corner, all those things. And you talk to the coaches and said, no, no, no. All we're doing right now is we're playing left and right, and we're trying to find the best four to six defensive backs and how they fit together. We'll figure that out on the back end of things. I, I think, frankly, with a, a roster that's experienced so much overhaul, when you do have a number of transfers, newcomers, transfers, five-star early enrollees. Simple is probably the best way to go and just use these spring practices not as a time to figure out what's set in stone, but a time to ramp up until summer and the fall. So can you figure out where Damani Jackson fits? Can you figure out where those freshmen fit? That'll happen with time, but I, I like the concept of just, just get the right guys out there right now, figure out who they are, and go from there. And if that's an overall look at maybe a, a defense that's maybe a little bit more simple than than Nick Saban's was. I know they hated when people called their defense complicated, but it was. If it is maybe a little bit simple, let those guys play a little bit earlier maybe, um, I think time will tell on that. But just kind of the feel of if you're starting from scratch anywhere, it's in that secondary. 100%. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that I talked to uh, Hitchler about, one of the defensive backs coaches, was that they're looking for a lot of positional versatility within the secondary. Like they want to have guys who can, you know, play that, you know, star husky position, I think is what they call it. They want guys who can go from safety to, you know, being a cover corner. They want guys who can play the slot and the outside, right? Like, so um, the other thing he mentioned there is that like a lot of these guys who are new, specifically the freshmen, they're just kind of playing them at one position right now because they want to get them comfortable. They kind of want to get them into the flow of things. What do practices feel like? What are they doing? Um, but then you also, you know, guys like Malachi Moore, you know, he's got, um, you know, history of playing star. That was really the only position he's played. Now he's playing strong safety. And I think throughout his career, he's kind of transitioned to, you know, he's played the safety role before primarily has played star. He's pretty good in coverage. Um, Keon Sab, the Michigan transfer, he's played both safety positions. Um, so, you know, I don't know how much he's actually going to, you know, work when it comes to, you know, some of the cornerback drills that they do, they probably want to keep him back there. Um, you know, a guy like Damani Jackson, I, so far as I know, only explicitly played cornerback. So they'll probably keep him there. Um, but then a guy like Tony Mitchell, right. Who's still trying to figure out his home in the secondary. I saw him run drills with both the safeties and the corners. So what are they going to do with him there? Is he a prime position for that Husky spot, which maybe has to play a little bit of both. Um, I don't know. I, it's it's going to be kind of interesting to see, you know, that's why, like, my, I guess my biggest question regarding the secondary is what does a two deep look like after spring ball? Like, where do all these pieces fit in? That's where I'm really curious about. And if you uh, talk about the love for Malachi Moore, if you questioned where Keon Sab was going to fit in in the secondary, uh, I think the comments from coaches, you go all over, it feels like a long time, a week ago, uh, uh, Kalen DeBoer saying that guy has the it factor. It's a pretty good indication that they trust this guy and they think he can make an impact. So, if you can find a couple of pieces like him that you can trust, I think that's pretty big if you can accomplish that coming out of spring. 100%. Mike, any thoughts on the secondary or Malachi Moore? 
Yeah, you know, I think the most interesting part to me with Malachi is that he's really going to go back to playing safety. Um, I think he talked about, you know, that's what the NFL really wants to see out of him. Now, they also wanted to see that out of Brian Branch. Uh, that was one of the reasons why I think Brian Branch considered at least coming back a couple of years ago. Ended up going he's doing all right. Right. Being an early second round pick and has, has done pretty well for himself. So, um, you know. I think Malachi Moore could have come out this past draft. I, he certainly would have been drafted uh, probably somewhere in the mid rounds, but you know, he has an opportunity here to prove himself as one of the best safeties in the country and maybe push himself up into a solid day two pick um, next year. So um, him doing that will probably be more in a deep safety position, but I think we'll see him still around the line of scrimmage, uh, maybe not covering the slot in that Husky um, job as much, but um, you know, certainly probably the most important piece of that secondary uh, to start with, at least. And then we'll see what happens at corner. But, um, you know, I personally did not watch the secondary, you know, on Wednesday. Uh, that was uh, the defense was your job. So I, I can't speak too much beyond that. Um, and, you know, we'll have another viewing a week from Thursday. Um, we'll be able to watch a little bit more and maybe flip sides here to get a different perspective. But. Um, for me, as far as the defense, you know, I think Keon Keeley is probably the guy that I would talk most about just because, A, he's one of their highest rated recruits of all time. I mean, he's top five in the country um, in his class last year and um, really a guy that I think people expected more out of last year, or at least expected to see him on the field. Um, when you think back to like Will Anderson and Dallas Turner and Drew Sanders getting on the field as freshmen, it didn't happen for Keon Keeley. And so they've moved him and it's a little bit more than just, and I know some people say you're going from Nick Saban's defense to Kane Womack's defense. Obviously there's going to be a position change for Keon Keeley, but it's a little bit more than that because the other outside linebackers, Quandarius Robinson, Keanu Cott, um, you know, the younger guys, uh, Rusa and, and Pierre, they're all staying at sort of the outside linebacker, the wolf spot. Whereas Keeley's moving to the bandit, which is more of a traditional 4-3 end, can really slide inside, be more like a you know 3-4 end, a Justin Boyby type of player. So he's had to gain some weight and probably still even get bigger from here. He's had to kind of learn a new way of doing things uh, with Freddie Roach as his coach. And there certainly seemed like there's a learning curve for him um, out of practice on Wednesday. And, you know, Freddie talked about that too. So, um, you know, a guy who I would still – uh, you know, you never really know, but like transfer portal candidates, he's still on that list. I'd say pretty high uh, because you just don't know how it's going to work out with him in this new defense at Alabama in general, still a name to watch. I would say in that regard, but it, you know, he all positive reviews from Roach as far as how he's approaching this position change. And um, you know, it's a, it's a big spring for him just to try to get a role, get on the field. And um, there's obviously opportunities, but you know, one of the, I think the biggest players that I'm, I'm continuing to watch here. Yeah. I, no. I was going to say, I did notice when I was at practice on Monday, again, we weren't out there forever, but being a walk over to the, the defensive line, I noticed Keon and didn't expect to see him over there. The work that Freddie was doing with him individually and the patience that looked like he was showing him, like understanding <laughs> this is new for you. Here's exactly where your hands are supposed to be. You know, he spent a solid minute, minute and a half, with him when when you think about how long a period is it's a lot of time so they're working with him they're being patient and one last thing on the defense uh when you go back to practice on monday i was sitting there looking where's kaylin DeBoer? where's kaylin DeBoer? here he comes flying through a couple different defensive drills just to see where things are going again a different change from nick saban where you know exactly where he's going to be he's going to be with his secondary he's going to be doing specific drills to see kaylin have his hands on everything i thought was pretty interesting yeah, I think with, with regards to Keon Keeley um, and just the idea of patience, um, I know that's something that Alabama fans sometimes struggle with, especially when it comes to five-star players. They want to see those guys. They want to see them immediately. They want to see them excel immediately. Um, let's pump the brakes a little bit on Keon Keeley, right? Like he showed up late, right? Like he didn't enroll until last summer. Um, and I remember consistently because we asked Nick Saban about it a lot. Um, Saban had said something to the effect of, look, it takes a lot of time for these guys to go from a hand in the dirt defensive end to learning how to play outside linebacker in that system specifically, which gets to the, you know, Hey, Saban's defense. He likes to say it wasn't complicated. A lot of the roles were kind of complicated, especially when you're talking about an 18 year old, 19 year old kid coming in, trying to learn 
all while adjusting to the speed of the college game. Like it makes a lot of sense why we did not see him last year. Now, the idea of more patience, he's switching back to what sounds like hand in the dirt defensive end, or at least something that is a little bit more similar to that. Here's what Kane Womack said specifically about Keon Keeley um, and his move to that bandit position. When you look at Keon, you see his frame and how he's developed. He's got a frame that's going to grow more into that bandit role for us. That bandit position can play the nine technique, five technique, and can reduce down and play four eye at times. I think as you see what Keon is developing into and may develop into at the next level, that's more of a better fit for him. I don't know that he's going to be a dude that's going to come out and, and just be a heavy hitter week one. Um, but if he continues to progress it the way that we believe he is and the way that the coaches are indicating, you know, maybe by that Georgia game or the game week after, right? Like, late September, early October, like maybe we start to see him a little bit more and not just see him, but maybe see him flourish. Cause I don't know that there's any doubt that he's a freak athlete. It's just sometimes you have to find those roles for those freak athletes so that you can get the most out of their freak athleticism. Right. So I don't know. Patience is, is a funny word to me because I think it's something that everybody could use when it comes to Keon Keeley. But Mike, you do make a point, you know, sometimes the player may not even be, may not even be patient enough. And you know, he could be a guy in the portal, you know, as early as April, if not after next season. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's just the reality sometimes with a lot of these guys that get into that situation. And, you know, I think LM is trying, like they're trying to switch positions. They're trying to make it happen, trying to make it work. Um, you know, it, I don't want to say it hasn't worked to this point, but it's certainly not what I think people envisioned, you know, with, with Keon Keeley, what their, um, kind of used to seeing from those five star outside linebackers. And look, at the end of the day, if Keon Keeley doesn't work out at Alabama and he's somewhere else in a year or two, you still had in that class Yonze Pierre, who's a five star outside linebacker. And you have Quay Rusa, who's honestly of those three guys, even though he's the lowest rated recruiting wise, seems to have come along the quickest, uh, who could contribute. And if you get two contributors out of three, even if your highest rated guy is not what you thought he was, then you know, it is what it is. It's kind of like Bill Parcells. It doesn't matter where you're drafted. It matters what you do when you get there. And, um, you know, we've seen lower rated guys work out over higher rated guys in the past and just how it goes sometimes. So, um, you know, again, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see him on the field at some point. It took Chris Braswell a little while to kind of get going at Alabama. Um, really three years for him to get going. Um, but if he's somewhere else in a year, I think that's also – kind of how things have also gone with with some of those guys. Tommy Brockemeyer comes in and doesn't really play in two years, and he's gone. So, um, you know, the script has certainly been there for for that sort of move in the past. Yeah, 100%. Just, to steal a line from Greg Byrne, the best thing about freshmen is they become sophomores. But the problem with the sport right now is how often they become sophomores at a right. different address. But, again, right. patience. Not everyone is Will Anderson. Sometimes it's a Chris Braswell where it takes a little bit of time. There's nothing right or wrong about it. It just happens that way. Yep. I would say more often than not, um, it's Chris Braswell's path, not Will Anderson or Dallas Turner's path. Like it's, you know, but Alabama fans aren't used to that because they're used to Will Anderson more than they are, um, you know, Chris Braswell. And spoiled at that position. I mean, it's been incredible how well they've recruited um, at outside linebacker for three or four years. I mean, just stacking five-star guys on top of each other, even a guy like Drew Sanders, who they couldn't really keep because they didn't really have a good spot for him. They had too many five-star guys. Um, to keep all of them. I think the one thing that maybe stuck out to me, at least from the defense, um, kind of piggybacking off of, you know, Matt <laughs> was kind of the leader in that secondary. Um, we got to look at the freshmen, Jalen Mbakwe, Zabian Brown, Zay Mincy, Peyton Woodyard. Those dudes all look the part. Like they are big. They are fast. I was watching them go through various corner drills and I'm like, these dudes are going to play in some capacity. I don't know how effective they'll be. I don't know how often they will play, but just, the combination of where the personnel standpoint is at now, just who's on the roster at certain positions and just the fact that they just look the part. I know that's, you know, we're couching this quite a bit and they're only three practices in, but um, kind of excited to see those guys go live goes um, as opposed to just running through drills, because I think that they all, they all looked apart. I'm, I want to see obviously a lot more of them before we really start to crown these kids, but they're rated five stars for a reason. Also, Zay Mincy, every bit of 6'3", probably closer to 200 than his listed 180. Like, these kids are huge. Um, and I'm really excited to see them more um, as spring goes and just, you know, continuously talking to the coaches about their overall development. Because, I, you know, five stars, obviously high expectations, but just getting a quick look at these guys last week, there's 
they can be special, man. They just they they look the part, and you can just see it. Yeah. An interesting prop that might be total combined starts between those those three five stars, but I think it's not a stretch to say they're going to need them. It's just in what capacity. I mean, the depth is the depth there, and unless they just go and have multiple guys in the portal who can start or play you know, serious snaps, they're going to need one or more of those guys to to be a contributor right away. Um. Yeah. Uh, the only last thing I think I had on the defense was, uh, it was kind of weird. And then it became really cool seeing Deontay Lawson wear number zero. Um, wasn't sure how I was going to feel about that, but like, if you're going to wear number zero, you better be damn good. Um, we know Deontay Lawson's an athletic freak, but, um, it was still just kind of bizarre to see it at first. And then I got used to it and I was just like, okay, like this, this could work, right? He needs to have a really good season, but, um, I don't know. What do you guys think about the new numbers? I don't think Nick Saban really was allowing it, you know. Um, I think that was probably the, the floodgate that had to open there. It was Nick Saban leaving for Deontay Lawson to wear number zero. But, um, you know, the more important thing that he's going to be wearing this year, I think, is going to be the helmet with the radio in it and see how he adjusts to that. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just an old school guy that says numbers don't matter, but it doesn't it doesn't do much for me. It's a clean look. You got to like the look. The only thing better than your starting middle linebacker being number zero is if your starting defensive tackle is number zero. I would have liked to see LT Overton just nab that thing. It would have looked even better. But I think it's cool. I mean, it's not. It's not gonna hurt him, right? What did uh? What number did Montez Sweat wear for? Not Montez Sweat. Uh, Devondre Sweat. Uh, he was like ninety nine or ninety eight. One of the two. 93. There was a, I feel like there's a Texas guy that had like a single digit number. Yeah. I don't know. Those, uh, those D linemen. One of their ends was like 18, right? Or am I misremembering that? I don't know. I guess I'm with Tom Brady on this. Like when the NFL allowed the single digit numbers for um, the front seven guys, it really screwed with quarterbacks because they're so used to like, all right, linebackers in the fifties and defensive linemen are in the nineties. And it's like, you start trying to identify different guys and they're wearing like 32 and like 76 and you have no idea what position they play. It's always been that way in college, but again, Tom maybe he's also down with avocado ice cream. So I don't know right. what we're talking about here. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're thinking of Anthony Hill Jr., the superstar true freshman. Uh, yes. that he, he, he wore number zero. He was more of like edge outside linebacker, but um, you know, hey, if you're gonna wear number zero, you better be good. Anthony Hill was very good this past year. So you know who um, I think I'm thinking of is um wait, Walter Nolan on AM wore number mm -hmm. zero. That's who I'm thinking of. He was also very good. So I think it, you know, no pressure, D Law, yeah. right? <laughs> Look good, play good, feel good, all that. Uh, but I believe the the exact phrasing he used was it's a new wave. So um trying to stay hip here. Okay. Um we met with the offensive staff and a handful of offensive players on Friday, a little bit later on Friday, so it might have been buried by some of the basketball stuff that was happening over the weekend. But we got to hear from offensive coordinator Nick Sheridan. We got to hear from, I think, almost all the position coaches. I, I don't know that we saw Brian Ellis, the tight ends coach, but every other one kind of cycled their way through. And then we got to hear, obviously, from Jalen Milrow, Kendrick Law. Two running backs came in. Tyler Booker came in from the offensive line. Um, Alex, start with you this time. What were maybe some – instant impressions from you know just listening to the offensive staff talk like similar to kind of what we were talking about with the defense what, what, what were your some of your biggest takeaways yeah it's an interesting thing i spent a, a decent bit around uh, robert gillespie and just talking about the transition um and what they've been going through and a lot of just reiterating look ball's ball with these guys and yeah the voice has changed but what they're trying to accomplish out there right now is is very much the same they're just trying to stay on task and then with with nick sharon just a guy who seems really cerebral. Does the moment didn't seem too big for him? I was interested. I mean, it's only a press conference. So let's not get carried away. But to see him on a podium answering questions uh, for a guy who's on the younger side of things and just starting to break through in this business, how he would handle that? It did not seem too big for him. It seemed perfectly capable. Um, so impressed overall. But it, it's very early days, um, and once we sort of get a, a handle on personnel and those tough questions that are being asked, I think things. The heat might get turned up a little bit, but uh, I liked where they were at. Nick Sheridan had the same demeanor as DeBoer, at least from where I was sitting and what I was watching, like just very calm, very even keel. He was phenomenal with a lot of his answers. He went into some pretty good depth over, you know, talking about Milrow, talking about Caleb Odom, the tight end room, um, you know, just his, how, how his, you know, he played quarterback at Michigan. How does that help him coach the current quarterback room? 
Um, but his just overall demeanor, just like very calm. I'm going to answer your question. I'm going to look at you while I'm doing it. Like, you know, clearly he's been taking notes on the way DeBoer has handled, you know, I, they work together at Indiana again at Washington now here in Alabama. Like he's been taking notes from the way DeBoer kind of carries himself. Yeah. And I think part of it too, and it, I think it holds true for both Sheridan and Womack is that their dads are both, um, longtime coaches themselves, you know, Bill Sheridan, uh, uh, Nick Sheridan's dad has been around forever. He was on the, the giant staff when they um, won the Super Bowl against the Patriots. He's been in the NFL. He's been in college. Um, Dave Womack, I believe, has been both um, in the NFL and college as well. So when you grow up around it, you know, I think there's just like a osmosis. You know, there's just you just understand how to talk as a football coach um, just from listening to your dad or listening to other coaches. I think it's just part of, of who they are. Um, and both of them were players as well. Not that I don't think Nick Sheridan probably didn't do a ton of interviews in Michigan. Maybe he did. I don't think Kane Womack did a bunch of interviews at Arkansas as a fullback. He probably didn't. But um, still, I think you're just around it. You know, you've seen it. You understand it. I think there's there's just a football lifer aspect to both of them, um, having grown up in it. So that doesn't surprise me too much, but it certainly impressed me uh, nonetheless where – and it wasn't just that, you know, Nick Sheridan was on, um, you know, the next round podcast a couple weeks ago and was very kind of, um, you know, wasn't necessarily highly quotable, but I think was very tight with his answers. And, you know, it all goes back to what I was saying at the beginning. Like, I don't think the, either of those guys are going to be out there saying things that Kalen DeBoer doesn't want them to say. Um, so even though we'll have a bunch of access to them and a bunch of interviews and press conferences, I don't think they're going to be saying outrageous things either. So, you know, I think they're gonna be pretty easy um, for, for Alabama to have up there. So, um, you know, Jamarcus Shepard is, is probably another guy that is worth talking about because, you know, a little bit different. Uh, I think he's going to be more quotable. I think there's going to be kind of these lines and these quips that he gives us. And um, even just talking about why he came, he said, it's Alabama enough said, what else is there to talk about? Uh, why are you guys here? <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was a good line. Um, you know, he talked about Kendrick Law and uh, how he wanted to be like him when he grows up. Um, you know, there's a couple other ones where, uh, you know, he's talking about his own family um, is, is from Uniontown, Alabama. And, um, you know, different different vibe than, than Womack in, um, in Shepard. You know, I think it it's going to be a little bit more energetic, a little bit more um, motivational, inspirational. Um, I think he's certainly one of those type of coaches. And, um, yeah, I think a guy that we're going to enjoy talking to. And um, I didn't spend a lot of time around Gillespie, but I did um, I did talk to uh, Kapilovic, still trying to get that one down, uh, the offensive line coach, you know, Chris Kapilovic. And um, another guy that kind of has his, his, uh, his slogan, you know, that's going to get picked up, I think, a little bit, the Juice Squad. Um, that he Juice brought, Squad! Right, from uh, – you know, from really Michigan State, which is where he was last year. Then he went to Baylor for a very short time and, and, and came here. But while he was at Baylor, he did an interview about it. And, you know, that's kind of what te – not teed me off, but, you know, kind of tipped me off to it um, was the Juice Squad chain that they'll wear. Um, there's pictures of Michigan State guys wearing it where it's a gold chain with diamond letters that say Juice Squad. And he kind of wants to promote his guys and have them – be recognized because, you know, offensive linemen are in the trenches. They don't get all the, the glory uh, when things go well. But, you know, when there's a penalty or a sack allowed, that's when uh, they kind of they kind of feel it. So, you know, he's he's classic offensive line coach, just I'm going to say rough around the edges. But he's, you know, you can just tell he's a, if you take one look at him. That, that guy's an offensive line coach. <laughs> uh, I just have to take listen to him for five minutes. That guy's an offensive line coach. Like there's a specific breed of football coach that it takes to – to run that position. And he's definitely um, part of that. So um, he was fun to listen to too. I think it's, it's going to be, um, you know, I think a scrutinized position this year because of all the changes and what they need to have happen at center and at tackle. Um, but he's a, you know, I think a pretty straight shooter, you know, as a, as a, um, an inter interviewee with us and, and a guy that again, kind of look forward to talking to you again. It can't hurt for, for a position that's going to be under the spotlight like they are to have maybe a little bit of looseness about them when it comes to wearing the chain and celebrating certain things. They didn't have a whole lot to celebrate the last few years in, in big moments. 
whether it was penalties or, or the bad snaps, if, if there was a if there was a group that need, needs maybe a mental reset uh, on this team from the last few years, I think that's arguably one of the top at the top of the list. Yeah. No doubt, no doubt. I think the the one similar to the defensive staff when we were talking, then the offensive staff, like and really just the entire staff at all as a whole. Good energy, a lot of good vibes, right? Like Jamarcus Shepard was talking about, you know, after he got off the the lectern that, you know, he's a big Archibald's guy, um, you know, and he's previously talked in other interviews about how he's not a receiver's coach, he's a taker's coach, um, you know, so he kind of exudes the energy that he wants his guys to play with. Kane Womack said something similar, like you lead from the front, I think was the exact word that he used. And so if he doesn't bring the good energy at practice, um, how can he expect his guys to bring good energy to practice? So saw a lot of that out of the offensive staff as well. Um, you know, even Nick Sheridan, like even though he was a lot more even keel with a lot of his answers, he just, you know, hyped basically every position group up that we talked to him about, you know, whether it was Jalen Milrow, Caleb Odom, um, you know, some of the other receivers, some of the Washington guys that transferred over both Sheridan and Shep gave glowing reviews of those guys, like just, just a lot of good energy. And it kind of gets back to the idea that like everything's brand new, everything's fresh. Um, they haven't screwed up yet, knock on wood. So like nothing but good vibes in that building right now, which, um, you know, that's kind of fun around this time of year, right? Like everybody's really good when it comes to spring football and, you know, nobody's, nobody's, every, everybody's, everybody's winning. Nobody's losing in spring ball. So it's the best um, part of spring. Everybody's zero and zero again. <laughs> and they're going to be zero and zero until August. Right. So right. everybody's undefeated. Um, Mike, we'll start with you when it comes to offense. Um, what were maybe some of the biggest takeaways that you had from talking to some of the players, the coaches and, and getting to watch um, practice for a little bit last week? Yeah, you know, I think the offensive line is, again, where people are going to be looking because that's arguably one of the biggest questions from last year, one of the biggest problems from last year. And, you know, it literally the season ended on a, a bad Seth McLaughlin snap. So, um, you know, the center position, I think a lot of people assumed that Parker Brailsford would come in and kind of be the automatic starting center. But that's really not the case. I mean, it's uh, mm. it's it's James Brockemeyer who is out there uh, with the first team, uh, at least for that practice on Wednesday. And again, we don't see, we didn't see Monday's practice. We didn't see Friday's practice. We didn't see the 11 on 11 drills. We don't know how much those two guys are rotating, but for Brockemeyer to be where he was is still very notable. And you talked to Tyler Booker as we did. He talked to Chris Kapilovic and um, you know, in both cases, it, it really sounds like Brockemeyer has a legitimate chance to win this job. Um, and you know, I would assume that, competition probably extends into August. Um, but that's that's still something to watch because Brockenmeyer really hasn't gotten on the field. You know, he's played in 16 games over his um, three seasons now, and the number of snaps have been very low. So that's a big jump for him, you know, to go from doing that to being a starting center in the SEC. But, um, you know, Brailsford knows the system, but he's a little bit undersized at 275. That was always the biggest question about him. So you have two different guys there that one of them has been around here a while. One of them has been around the system a while um, and kind of seeing who wins that job is, is going to be a big story. And then, you know, the tackle spots, you know, I think we knew Elijah Pritchett was the most likely guy to be at left tackle. And that certainly seems to be uh, the case or was the case on Wednesday. I don't think there's too much question that he'll be the guy there. I don't think there's unless there's somebody better out there, uh, which there isn't right now. Um, but then the right tackle spot was Loken for me. That was a little bit of a surprise because, again, not a guy who played very much last year. Um, again, not a ton of options on the roster. You have Miles McVeigh, who didn't play last year as a freshman. You have, um, you know, Bertrand, Nicole Bertrand, who came in from um, Texas A&M, who hasn't really played. So kind of throw the names in a bucket and see who comes out. But it seems like Will Conformby right now might have the best shot. Physically, he's there. I mean, he's 6'7", 320. Like, he looks it. Um, but it's just very, uh, very limited amount of uh, tape on him. So those are center and right tackle are going to be the two biggest spots. And right now it was Brockemeyer in, in uh, Form B. Call me crazy, but I don't know that Parker Brailsford leaves Washington if he doesn't think he could be the guy here. So I wonder if that's just like, you know, I don't want to say it was a smoke screen, but like I, I wonder why maybe that Brockemeyer was, you know, center number one, I guess, during that Wednesday scrimmage that we were not scrimmage practice that we were able to watch. Um, but the tackles, I think to me is like really interesting because I'm not sure that I pegged Wilkin Formby as potentially, you know, starting right tackle. You know, if you'd asked me a week or so ago, um, you know, those are two, I, not two positions, but the two tackle spots, I think were obviously like, you know, 
they're going to go to the portal in April. How many tackles are they going to try and get? I think is probably the biggest question. So, you know, but Hey, if, if a couple of those guys develop a little bit and they only feel like they need to go get one tackle in April, um, that's obviously good news for the offensive line moving into the summer months. So um, that's intriguing. I think we'll see what happens. Alex, you got any thoughts on the offensive line from what we were able to gather last week? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm with you, Cody. I, I'm inclined to say it's Parker's job at center until proven otherwise. I, I think he was as highly regarded as he was for a reason. But Mike's right. It, you watch, you look at him on a practice field, and you do notice that he is not as big as everybody else. Now, if there's a position where you can get away with it, it is center. I mean, that is a position that requires sometimes more intellect than brute strength. Um, I mean, Alabama fans will remember a guy like William Blahos, who maybe made people didn't expect, but ended up being a major contributor for a long time. Um, so uh, I'm inclined to think that he figures out he can make it work. He's always been that size, uh, and he, he performed pretty well in Washington. Uh, and then, again, if you can get Pritchett sorted away, and that's not a question mark coming out of the spring, I feel like that's a decent place to be going into a period where you're going to have to be active in the portal, whether it's a lot or a little bit at, at right tackle. All good and, point. And just to quote Tyler Booker on, um, on James Brockmeyer, it says, uh, if I can find the quote in my, my story. Oh, he says, I'm super proud of James. He said, he's a guy that just stayed the course. Now he has an opportunity to win that job this spring, according to Tyler Booker on um, James Brockmeyer. So here we are. That's notable. That's notable. Alex, what stood out to you when watching the offensive guys at practice, talking to some of those guys last Friday? What was maybe the most interesting thing that popped? Well, unfortunately, I didn't bring a telescope out to practice, so we couldn't <laughs> see much of the uh, the running backs, receivers, and quarterbacks. Uh, we're kind of cordoned off on a little area, so our view is mainly the defense and, and some offensive line. We had a good view of those guys. But just talking to Jalen Milrow after we're, uh, later in the week, it's the first time we've been able to talk to him since uh, the Michigan game, obviously. And just hearing where his head's at with going through a major transition. Obviously, last season was a big shakeup for him just in terms of how he developed. And then, oh, yeah, all those things you learned with, with Tommy Reese, we're doing something different now. So him being in a new place and telling us, yeah, you know, let's let's be honest about this. There were teams coming after him. 100% he said there were in terms of the transfer portal. And definitely that was occurring, but that he wanted his mindset the whole time was to return to Alabama uh, and in lack of a better way of putting it, finish what he started. But uh, very interested to see where he's at in terms of uh, learning the new system. I think it's still too early to say in that respect. But one thing I think you can say from talking to him is just the, the positivity in terms of I now have a coach who is built toward offense. Like Nick Saban, let's not forget, he played a quarterback in high school, but that's a long time ago. His expertise was on the defensive side of the ball. So to have a guy, a head coach who knows that position, well, layer that in with Nick Sheridan. And, oh, by the way, we learned that Mitch Dolan, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, he's an off-the-field staffer who's working closely with the quarterbacks. Jalen shouted him out as a guy who he's been spending a lot of time with and learning from. And to put one last point on the Jalen Milrow thing, um, Let's not freak out about a potential throwing motion change. He certainly threw cold water on that when he talked to us. I think it's it's more just him working on certain things right now, tweaking things here and there. Um, we'll see a whole lot more as we move down the line. But just a guy right now who is trying to work on some things while also learning a new offense. But, but overall just being, I think, in a good place in terms of uh, starting fresh and dealing with the new coaching staff. Yeah, he seemed like just listening to him talk last week. Um, you know, he's always I feel like he's always been pretty good between the ears, but like he has seemed especially calm and comfortable and relaxed when you know he stood up at the lectern and we all kind of surrounded him, talked to him last week. Um, I think you know the other thing too, I know we were talking about this with Keon Keeley, but the idea of like patience and development. Um, Jalen Milrose had three offensive, this will be his third offensive coordinator in four collegiate seasons, right? So like he, you know, his first offensive coordinator, you know, allegedly wanted nothing to do with him at quarterback, right? Bill O'Brien. Then he had Tommy Reese. And you could maybe argue that the offensive line didn't really help the entire offensive operation. So Milrow was kind of thrust into that position because he gave that operation the best chance to be successful. And now you've got a third one here, which, you know, there's a coaching staff here that has proven to get the most out of quarterbacks to help them develop further. Um, you know, but they, they just, 
is he going to be the guy, right? Like that's another thing that we've talked about so far. It seems like he's carrying himself. Like he's the guy. He took all the reps with what we presume to be the ones last week when we were able to watch practice. Um, you know, that's the idea of patience and development. In addition to this is a guy that seems very relaxed right now in March. Um, you know, I'm kind of curious to see kind of all of those factors come together and what does it mean for the fall? Um, you know, and let's, let's not forget he was recruited by Sark as well. So if we want to go back alone, not that far, it's the fourth offense coordinator he's interacted with wearing an Alabama polo or whatever the heck they wear. Uh, I, think, I think well, the interesting thing, which Jalen didn't go too far into, is how the responsibilities might change and, and maybe those pre- and post-snap reads, the option kind of stuff that the, the offense really seemed to last year kind of keep narrowing and narrowing and narrowing what he did. Uh, in order to just benefit what he was doing in terms of the positive way, how much the playbook gets opened up for him. I think uh, that's up to him and the coaching staff over the next few weeks. Um, curious to see how that plays out. I, I feel like we're forgetting Ryan Grubb. I mean, Jalen Burrow <laughs> played <laughs> Ryan yes. Grubb as an offensive coordinator, or at least was under him. Five and different offensive table. coordinators in four seasons, not even his fourth season yet. <laughs> I mean, it's debatable whether Ryan Grubb was legally an employee of Alabama. We'll have to see how that all shakes out. But, I mean, for a month, everybody thought that was going to be his coordinator. I'm sure Jalen Milrow was operating under that premise as well. So that's another um, change for him. And it's, you know, it's just some guys it just happens, you know, where you know, all these changes happen around you. And Milrow just seems very committed to – um staying the course for himself um, here at Alabama, which, you know, I think has certainly earned him the respect of a lot of fans. You know, I think you talk about fan favorites on this 2024 team. I don't know if there's a player higher on that list than Jalen Murrow going into this year. Um, you know, maybe Malachi Moore, maybe Tyler Booker, but I think Milrow is clearly the face of the team. Um, and it's still strange thinking like, can we sit here on March 11th and guarantee that he's going to start every single game for Alabama quarterback this year? I'm not sure we can. Um, we just don't know how this whole quarterback situation is going to play out over the course of the spring and in the fall um, as far as Kalen DeBoer's system. But for right now, you know, I think he's handled everything admirably um, that's happened around him. Yeah. And to that end, um, I know DeBoer and Nick Sheridan were both asked, you know, hey, like, is Milrow your guy right now? And they were like, yeah, he's our guy right now. So going to be an interesting development and subplot to monitor, you know, not just through the spring, but obviously in fall camp in August when they all reconvene. Mike, what was the most interesting offensive takeaway from you for last week? Well, beyond the offensive line, you know, I think it, it's probably Caleb Odom um, just because of how much people want to talk about him and how much, you know, I think he was <laughs> impressive too in, um, in bowl practice. That's something that <clears throat> maybe got flown under the radar a little bit. Um, but it's something that people do talk about was, you know, he was making waves a little bit in a good way. Um, you know, he was out there before the um, the Rose Bowl. So you already have guys that are paying attention to you because of that. And then, you know, you're switching positions and you're going to a position that doesn't really have, you have guys like Law and, and Bernard and Prentice, but like, there's an opportunity there for other receivers to step up. Like okay, nothing's set in stone at wide receiver. Um, so you have a six foot five guy that is, you look out there in that position group and he's towering above everybody else. Uh, I know the feeling. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, it definitely stands out in more ways than one. So, you know, he's, he's going to be a guy that I think the mystery of him, kind of the potential of him, I think is going to intrigue a lot of people. Um, he's going to be that guy that if he's not on the field this fall, people are going to be asking about where he is. It's kind of like you know, Tyler Harrell a couple of years ago when he came in from um, Louisville and was kind of billed as a speed guy and he was never on the field. And every single game, people are asking, where's Tyler Harrell? Where's Tyler Harrell? If Caleb Odom is not on the field, people are going to be asking where he's where he is. He's going to be on the sideline. But why, I think, is, is the operative question there. So, um, you know, he's just you can tell like he's just one of those guys that – um, people are going to pay attention to all year long. I think the intrigue is probably what has piqued a lot of people's interest, right? There was the whole social media bio changes before we even got to watch practice last week. Um, then we get to watch practice and it's like, yep, he's out there running specifically with the receivers because the tight ends were on a different part of the field and he wasn't over there. Um, and then when we got to talk to the offensive guys, right? Um, I think it was Kendrick Law who said like, yes, Caleb Odom is a wide receiver. He is not a tight end. He is elite. 
He's the biggest we have height wise, which is true. He's six, five. I think the next tallest receiver is six foot one. Um, he's the most aggressive guy. This is Kendrick law. Again, when I look at him, I see George Pickens. That doesn't spell good news when it comes to downfield blocking, but that's a guy that's playing in the NFL, right? So that's, Hey, you know, he's real aggressive off the line. He has strong hands and he goes up and attacks the ball. That's what Kendrick law finished with. Um, we asked obviously Jamarcus Shepard about him. Um, you know, and he basically more or less outlined that like, look, this dude's six, five, he's got a long wingspan. He runs like a receiver. Um, let's just put him in a position to be a little bit more successful. Nick Sheridan said a lot of the same things that this is, you know, he's six, five, but you know, six, five, two fifteen, that's pretty big for a receiver, but as a tight end, that's pretty small. Right. And you think yep. about all the duties that tight ends have, um, helping chip blocking is another one. Right. And I think Nick Sheridan said specifically, like, we don't want this dude right now having to go up against, you know, six, four, 280 pound defensive ends because they just don't think he could probably handle it right now. So sure. while his body is more of a receiver type, cause it may vary what, you know, you're six, five, two fifteen. There's a lot of frame there to fill out. He could potentially be a tight end down the line, but while it's a receiver, let's use him here. So, you know, makes a lot of sense to me. I'm super intrigued by it. Um, you look at what they did at Washington the last couple of years, this staff specifically, Roma Dunze wasn't quite six, five, but he was six, three, you know, two fifteen. They like having a big body like that. They like having big receivers like that. who can do a, with a lot of stuff after the catch. They think Caleb Odom can be that guy. So whether or not that translates into a starting role, right? Because I know this summer, Ryan Williams will come in. Um, he'll join the receiver room. And I know they're very, very excited about that guy too. So um, yeah, I think it's the intrigue that has both fans and us just really curious, like, what is this going to look like in the fall? Is it going to look like anything in the fall? And if it does, like how much of an impact does it have on the entire offensive operation? I don't know. Alex, you got any other thoughts? Yeah, whether he plays, we call him a tight end, call him receiver, whatever he plays, the fact that he can go inside at that size and create mismatches is is why we're all excited about him. And, and to put it even another point on it, like Alabama fans have been waiting for the mythic hybrid tight end for a few years now, whether it's Billingsley or Nye Black, guys who have that potential to play a major role in the passing game in multiple ways and just for one reason or another didn't pan out. So is this the guy who can break through? Again, whether we call him a tight end, whether we call him a receiver, a big body like that can do can do a lot of things, not just in the red zone, but just with the ball in his hands. Uh, I think he could be a real weapon in the offense. But uh, we've been waiting on something like that for a while. Maybe this is the guy who can kind of break through and deliver on that promise. Yeah. It'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see um, kind of how this all unfolds. There's always a lot of interest, um, or at least there's going to be a lot of interest in this Alabama team for a number of different reasons this spring. Um, but hey, I think that was all I had, guys. I really just kind of wanted to go through a roundtable and and hit on some of the things that we found interesting through the first week of spring ball. But like like we said earlier, they're off this week, so you know once they reconvene the following week. Um, which for those who have a calendar out, it's going to be the first week of the NCAA men's basketball tournament. Um, so we'll see kind of what all we can learn from that second week and circle back around for another podcast after that. So guys, any other final thoughts before we sign off here? That does it for me. I think we nailed it. Okay. Would have been nice to go on a nice sunny spring break, but we're, we're here working. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Paradise is the state of mind, Alex. Um <laughs> But yeah, that's all we've got today. Uh, like I said, we'll be back um, sometime next week for another football pod. We'll probably be back later this week for a basketball pod since the NCAA men's ba or NCAA SEC men's basketball tournament is later this week in Nashville. In the meantime, though, be sure to rate and review the show wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, even our Bama 247 YouTube page. Subscribe to Bama 247 and 247 Sports. You can get all the latest updates from spring football, men's and women's basketball, postseason tournaments, and more. We're running a special because we're always running a special, so be sure to take advantage of that or send it to the Alabama fan in your life. As always, we appreciate you guys for listening. We'll talk to you all again soon.